Now, let's get down to what our theme is. The chairman mentioned it. Do not underestimate the devil's designs. So it's very apparent that the devil has considerable influence in the world today. In fact, you know well the text that says the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. And then it gets even stronger when we read what the Apostle Paul wrote, and he said, the devil's the god of this system of things. A God is a powerful one. And yet the Bible is very clear. His influence is over that of the whole world. So he is a foe to be uh, reckoned with. Now, think about this. We're God's people faithfully trying to serve him and do our best. Are we exempt? in any way from his influences. If you thought no, you had the correct answer. We're not immune from his influences. We've not been exempted from the power that he exerts. But now have you thought about it this way? The fact of the matter is he's after you personally which adds a dimension to what we're talking about. Use your Bible, please, and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And there in 1 Peter chapter 5, we just like to consider one verse there. And it's number 8. And it says, Keep your senses... Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking to devour someone. Now, I gave emphasis to a particular part of it. I elevated my voice. The school guidebook says that is one way <laughs> to give emphasis. So... But I wanted you to notice that. It said the devil is your adversary. Now, an adversary is someone who strives against you. And this is the point we wanted to take really note of, that it's not just a matter of the devil out there giving general problems to people. He strives against you. He is, in fact, looking to get you. Now, the question is, what does he want to do to you? He has an agenda. He, first of all, wants to try to devour or weaken your spirituality. And, of course, there are a number of ways he can work uh, diligently at that. And then thereafter, he wants that to affect your relationship with God. Very serious. Because if he does things that will isolate us from God and weaken our good relationship with him, then we're in a very serious situation. And then finally, he'd like to destroy your opportunity to get everlasting life in God's new world. That's his agenda. And he is your adversary. An adversary is someone who strives against you. So we're not to think of his awesome power and control as just over the world and those who are not in any particular relationship with God. We have to see him as someone who calculated with a specific agenda and focus on us individually. So the thought that uh, he's just simply after God's people collectively or as a group is not the case. 
He's your adversary. He strives against you. So the question is, the question is not whether you are ever going to be in some big clash with him, showdown or fight, because you will, you are, maybe you have already. But the real question here is, when it happens, are you going to win? Because an adversary is an opponent. Opponent draws you into some type of a fight. And when you have a fight, you have a winner and you have a loser. So that's what the real question then becomes. Now here's the encouraging part. We do not have to lose in spite of the power and awesomeness of our adversary. In fact, we could say there is only one way we would come out a loser. What would you say that is? Simply put, if we leave the protection of our God, Jehovah, then we're vulnerable and we could come out the loser. But as long as we stay close and draw ever closer to Jehovah God, even though the devil is as powerful as he is, having the whole world in his power, we have enough protection that he cannot take us down as the world would put things now. Now, here is what the problem is in dealing with the devil, and here... It's why we give the thought, don't underestimate his designs. And that is because he works with great subtlety. And he is so subtle at times, it makes him so difficult to deal with because he will sort of try to lure a person into a situation that's going to cause him to maybe place in jeopardy his relationship with God or his good standing in the congregation. Now, here's what someone is thinking. They're saying, you say the devil is subtle in his design and he will try to lure people into a situation to get them to displease God and thus draw back from God. But they say, I know for a fact the Bible says we are not ignorant of his designs. So they say, how do you reconcile the two? They say, if we know what his designs are, how can he be subtle enough to lure us away? So they're saying, what about that scripture then? We are not ignorant of his designs. Since they thought of that, let's answer it. First of all, is it a true statement? Absolutely yes. In other words, what that scriptural statement says is, he doesn't have anything brand new to spring on you. He doesn't have anything that he hasn't done before millions of times. He can't spring on you some totally different design or trap because everything we know about his designs we've read and studied many times in his word. What are the major ones then that we are not ignorant of and that we know about? Well, we know one thing he will try to do is to get someone to cave in and seek some fleshly desire. Often he pressures them and pushes them so that they feel they must immediately satisfy whatever the flesh is craving or crying out for. He's worked that millions of times. Another design is he will seek to get someone to weaken spiritually and then give priority to materialistic things. In other words, he tries to get them to uh, adopt a materialistic lifestyle, which simply means instead of spiritual things being first, put material things first. And then he knows that's going to affect our relationship with God. 
Then another thing he will try to do is to uh, get someone to feel that uh, they're not really getting anywhere in life. They really need to be somebody. They need to have a little personal glory or fame. They want to hear the round of applause for them, not just everybody else. And so they feel in their own way they need to pursue something or do something that's going to give them some personal recognition. And so instead of remaining uh, devoted and focused on spiritual things, they'll decide they're going to uh, pursue uh, one of their talents that maybe had been just uh, latent for many years, but since they have it now, uh, they feel, well, I need to develop that, or maybe they feel they need to get a more extensive uh, education in order to get a, a career that is going to uh, suit and fit uh, what they want in the way of a lifestyle. So he will push that. These are his designs. And then one other one, he will try to blur the proper application of some scripture. In other words, he will try to get the individual to look at a scripture and make a soft application of it in their own life. I'll give you an example. A few scriptures and maybe you can think of it. First Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Now, you can apply that strictly and keep yourself protected from the bad associations that can take you away from the truth. Or you can start looking at the people that you would like to be with and say, oh, they're not that bad. What's the problem anyway? Here's another one they uh, will sometimes make a soft application of, and that's uh, what is stated there in 1 Corinthians 7.39. What does that say? Well, that says to marry only in the Lord. You ever see someone uh, know that scripture and make a soft application of it when it comes to their own life? And it's just amazing if you start to listen to how they like to get around this. They know this is in the Bible. They know what God says. But. And then you see them come up. The Lord will understand here. He knows what I'm going through. And next thing you know, the application really of that scripture is blurred. Or uh, when it says to quit mixing in company with anyone called a brother, that is... And instead of naming all the vices, we can say disfellowship, 1 Corinthians 5, 11. But sometimes when it uh, comes in the family, then instead of strictly applying that, a soft application is made of that text. Enough examples. So we can see all of these designs of Satan are known, nothing new. He has used them successfully over and over again in the centuries. Now, that being said, there are some things in regard to his designs, even including the ones mentioned, that we don't know. For example, we do not know what method he will use on us individually. Remember we read in 1 Peter 5, 8, it said, your adversary. So even though we mention major methods or design, you don't know the one he's going to try on you. In addition, you don't know whether he will make a surprise attack that everything seems like it's all right, and then out of nowhere, you're surprised. Oh, that's what he's going to try on me. Often the element of surprise can be the difference between succeeding or failing. 
So we don't know if it will come that way. Now, another thing we do not know is whether he is going to try multiple tests on us all at the same time. More than one. See, we might figure, okay, that's his design to try to seek to pull me off in doing that. But suppose he hits one, two, three things all at the same time. Remember Joe? He threw everything at him he possibly could. He took him down so that even his health was almost ruined. He lost everything economically. He lost in death ten children at the same time. And they tell us to lose one child in death is probably the most traumatic experience a parent can have in life. Ten, one time. And then finally his wife turned to him and encouraged him to give it up. God's not with you. Curse him and die. Multiple trials all at the same time. So this is what we have to think about in considering his designs, that while known what his methods are and that he has nothing absolutely new, we don't know how he will craft this for us. Let's illustrate it. How many know something about baseball? Let me see if this is going to work here. Okay. Okay. Big league town, you ought to know something about baseball. <laughs> All right, there, there's a pitcher, and there is a batter. And, of course, the pitcher's idea is to strike the batter out. So the batter is at the plate, and he's waiting for the pitch. Question, does he know what kind of pitch will come back? He doesn't know that. All he knows is, I'm at the plate, that's the pitcher, he's going to throw the ball somewhere near the plate. He'd like to get it over the plate in some part so he gets a strike. But the pitcher has many options. He can throw a fast ball, he can throw a slow ball. He can throw a curved ball. He can throw a nasty curve. Or a knuckleball. See, he's got a whole range of pitches. So it isn't enough just to know, I'm going to the plate and this pitcher's going to throw the ball. The pitcher sort of holds the key to it because he can go out to that plate and he can throw what he wants. And frankly, that's why good hitters strike out. You look at the statistics, the best hitters of all time, most of them struck out the most time because the pitcher holds the key. He decides the kind of pitch he's going to deliver to the plate. If he can mix it up enough, he can get him out and strike. Well, that's what we're talking about here with the devil and his designs. You know he's going to come after you because the text very clearly said, your adversary, the devil. But then also in that verse it said, be watchful. You have to maintain a certain level of alertness because just like that batter, you don't know what's coming the way. So one major underestimation of the devil's design is for someone to feel I have all of his machinations covered. I know the crafty acts. So he's not going to catch me. That's what he wants us to think. He wants us to underestimate his designs. Now here's something else that makes him so formidable as a foe or an adversary. And it is the fact that he uses, follow this, deception. In fact, he has been called the master of deception. Now, what's deception? Simply put, 
deception is when someone tries to get you to accept as true something that is false. Very simple definition. Deception will try to get you to accept as true something that's untrue or false. Remember Eve, the mother of us all? That's what he used there. Clearly God had told uh, her through her husband Adam that there was the one tree neither of them should eat of. God pointed out its location so they were well aware of exactly where this tree was located. Now, notice how the devil plots. In his deception, he approaches her as a serpent, a lowly serpent, crawling along as if, I don't have anything to do with this Eve, but God didn't give you the straight of this. He knows this, that if you eat of that tree, you're going to be as wise as he is. You won't need him. You can cut him out and run your life the way you'd like to run it. I don't have anything to do with this, but I'm aware of it. And <laughs> I'm just really letting you know what's going on here in Eden. <laughs> Sounds very simple, but remember, she went for it. That sounded all right to her. Here's someone. He has no stake in this, just crawling along here. <laughs> and he tells me I can be free of this. I can be like God. So she went and ate uh, from the fruit of that tree. She took some and took it over to her husband, Adam. Explained to him what happened. Well, he wasn't deceived. He knew she was wrong and that Satan had deceived her, but he wanted to go along with her and he ate from it. The consequences? Exactly what God had said. He said, the day you eat from this tree, you will surely die. And in that day, as God calculates things, up to a thousand years, meaning a day, they both died. We're several thousand years from that time, and they're still dead, and they will remain dead forever. Sad consequences based on a deception that their adversary, Satan the devil, introduce that's why we said we can't underestimate that his designs carry this element of deception and that possibly we could be taken in by some deception that he's trying to perpetrate in our life now a variation of this tactic that is, of using deception to get someone to believe something that's true that's actually false, is embraced in this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, we quoted part of it earlier, but we'd like to look at all of it in its setting and see exactly what it's telling us. 2 Corinthians. Now, the second chapter is the one that uh, we want here. And the verse that uh, we want to read is number 11. Now, we'll read the whole verse this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, follow what it says there because I'll pose a rhetorical question after it's read. Verse 11. It says that we may not be overreached by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his design. And the latter part, we've already given discussion to that. We know we're not ignorant of his design. But what is the implication of the first part where it says that we may not be overreached by Satan? For we are not ignorant of his designs. 
Is it not that even though we are not ignorant of his designs or methods, there is still the possibility that we might be overreached by Satan? So the knowledge that we have about his methods or designs is to be used to help us or prevent us from being overreached by Satan. Now, to expand our understanding of that a little, let me give you a few other examples how other Bible translations render uh, that word, which is nicely translated in the New World Translation as overreached. But just to expand our view of it, one translation says, get the upper hand. So in other words, it's saying, We're not ignorant of his designs. But you don't want him to get the upper hand. Another translation says, take advantage of. So that implication is clear that even though not ignorant, we could be taken advantage of by such a master of deception. Another translation simply says, cheat. We know him to be a liar and a deceiver, so it includes cheating. But the one I like best is how the New International Version of the Bible translated that expression overreached. And they say there, outwit us. So that thought is, yes. We know his designs, we're not ignorant of them, the Bible lets us know them, but even though you have that knowledge, watch that he does not outwit you. Okay, let's illustrate it. Let's go back to baseball, you did pretty good with that last one. <laughs> Certain men in the game have distinguished themselves as speedsters, and when they get on bases, they steal bases. The opponents know if this hitter gets on base, he's very dangerous because he has the speed to steal a second and maybe a third base while on. But it happens this time, the speedster, he makes it to first. Now, notice the scenarios that are set up when you get this base stealer on first. Basically, everybody as the opponent gets nervous because they know he's going to try to outwit them and go from first to second. So the pitcher is nervous because he can't so fully focus on his batter now because he's got to keep one eye on this speechster, this dancing back and forth, threatening to run. The first baseman can't really play his position because he's got to stay close to the bag because if he tries to take too big a lead, then he wants the ball thrown to him so he can tag him out. Second baseman is in disarray because he can't go and play his position. He's got to be ready to run over second in case he starts down there and the catcher throws it. He can get him out. And the catcher is very nervous. He's in a state of alertness because he's got to get the ball right away and see how fast he can throw it down there. So everybody is in disarray and nervous as this speedster dances back and forth, playing the game, seeing if he's going to outwit them. And then his coach, just to throw him off, he's giving all kind of signals on and off of doing this, just to try to confuse everybody there on the other team and keep them uh, guessing what's going to happen now. So then all of a sudden here the pitcher is ready to deliver his ball. He's coming toward the plate. There's the speedster, starts down the second, slides in. The throw there is late, and he's safe. He outwitted them. But was it because nobody knew what he was going to do? The fact of the matter is, everybody knew what he was going to do. <laughs> but he did it. He outwitted them all. He was able to pull this off successfully by using that strategy to get the upper hand, to get a jump on the ball, to outwit them 
and to steal an extra base. And the fact of the matter is, some have done it over and over. The all-time record is uh, held by a speechster who in one season stole 130 bases. The next guy hit 118. But the point is, those who are clever enough, understand the game enough, and they have the speed, they get there and they outwit their opponent. So what is that telling us? It's telling us exactly what we read there in Scripture, that we may not be overreached by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs, yes, but he is seeking, if possible, in any way he can, to outwit us and get us to do what it is that he wants us to do anyway. And you know really what he tries to do and is often successful? He will often start by trying to get the faithful servant of God to nibble at a wrongdoing. Not take a big bite or woof it down, but just to sort of nibble at it a little bit. See, the, the worldly unbeliever on a job starts complimenting our sister in a very endearing way day after day. He tells her how good she looks. I love your hair today. That outfit is stunning on you. Well, who doesn't want to hear that? They pick these out and all. But he has a design. And then next, the compliments get to be more. And he notes that she usually eats alone. And so he says, why don't we eat together? There's a nice little place here, and then we can talk. And so she feels, well, what's wrong with eating? I do eat alone, and so they eat together at noontime, and then the conversations become a little more frequent while they're in the workplace. You see his design, he's moving little by little. He doesn't know that Satan is maneuvering him in order to get our sister in a situation that compromises her faith. And then it's maybe after that. What about after work? Let's go out somewhere. See, it's little by little. He's trying to outwit her. No, Satan is behind it, as we know. But he is using him to pitch to her something that he wants to hear something that she would like to hear, something that he says. And next thing you know, nibbling at it little by little, it often leads to a very bad situation. We have too many of them that start something like that or similarly that ends up in someone having to come before the uh, elders and in some way being disciplined by the congregation. That's what Satan wants. Just start nibbling at it. Because then he goes into action trying to outwit the person. And the simple answer is that uh, the individual in uh, this case has underestimated where this little nibbling it wrong uh, can be. Well, it can be anywhere. It can involve uh, entertainment that is uh, questionable. It can involve uh, overindulgence in uh, alcoholic drinks. Uh, it might involve uh, visiting unwholesome uh, Internet sites and just feeling, well, I want to see a little bit what they're saying out here. It might involve getting in a chat room, as some have done, and and later feeling that there's someone there that they have to meet uh, under some circumstance. It goes on and on and on. But much of this starts 
with just nibbling at what is the wrong. And Satan knows once that is in play, then it opens up the possibility to lure them more fully into something that is going to lower their spirituality, affect their good relationship with God, and then finally jeopardize their prospects for everlasting life in God's new world. Now, is this just something imagined? Now, look at what Paul said here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He was well aware of uh, the situations of face, facing the brothers and sisters at uh, his time. 2 Corinthians, now it's chapter 11. Now, look there at verse 3, and notice how he uh, puts this. He says, but I am afraid that somehow, as the serpent seduced Eve by its cunning, your minds might be corrupted away from the sincerity and the chastity that are due to Christ. So he said, I see in this environment the need to be concerned because I am frankly afraid that just like Eve was seduced, deceived, and went along with the serpent. He said, I see him working on your minds. And I fear in some cases the sincerity and the chastity or the high standard that would eliminate nibbling at wrongdoing is possibly going to affect some of you. That was his expression. Is this something that is pertinent uh, for us in this day and time? All the more so we can say. So there is need for concern. So then the question comes up next. What can help us to continue faithfully serving Jehovah, not be deceived or outwitted by our adversary, Satan the devil? We have good examples in Scripture. The best in this area, of course, is when it comes to Jesus Christ himself. The Bible reports that his adversary launched a triple-pronged attack against him on the occasion after he had fasted for some 40 days. Now, that's a benefit and an example to us because multiple tests, all at the same time, with most of the elements of deception and design that the devil uh, has used over and over again, and yet, Jesus passed all three tests. So, in that way, uh, we're helped. You recall the second test. He basically challenged him and pointed out, well, if you are a son of God, I know Scripture says if you hurl yourself off a high place, that you're not going to crash and be killed because he said he would send his angels to uh, catch you before that and you wouldn't even hit a foot on the ground. So he was quoting Scripture. But it was blurred, wasn't it? It wasn't the right application. Jesus caught it. And so he refused to do it. He would not hurl himself off that battlement of the temple. So that second test he passed successfully. Then, as you recall, the uh, third one that uh, he felt he would go for getting some fame and glory. And so he reviewed for him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, the praise and the honor they could bring an individual, the prestige. And he said, you, you can have it all. I'll give all this to you. But there was a catch to it. Now, the reason I stopped and said there was a catch to it is to make us think, well, that's the devil's design. Yes, yes. It might be an avail, very appealing uh, offer in some way. But what we need to ask ourselves, what's the catch? How many remember what the catch was in that case? I'm just bringing it out. What was it? Okay, quite a few uh, remembered it. The catch was 
Let's bow down and give me a little act of worship. Just a little, not a lot. Just enough to show you recognize I'm the one doing this for you. And then you can have it all. A test, but Jesus came through it quite successfully. That's the second and third one. Now, the first one we say for last because the first one was the most difficult. I think when we explain why, you'll see why it's the most difficult and the one that we need to pay attention to. The first test involved a fleshly desire. And when it comes to a test that involves a fleshly desire or something that the flesh is craving for to have in satisfaction, it's the most difficult test there is to face. I'd like to just read you a little excerpt here from the Watchtower to show how this works itself out in real life. Uh, the Watchtower is 1999, and it's the issue of April 1. I'm going to read a portion, a paragraph on page 30. Listen to what it says there. It says, through entertainment, music, and advertising, sexual messages saturate people's consciousness. God's servants are not immune to this assault. In fact, the majority of those disfellowshipped from the Christian congregation are individuals who succumb to such practices. Only by continually repudiating these immoral suggestions will a Christian remain chaste. So there's the fact. Fleshly desires, and these are fed by Satan, it said, through the entertainment, the music, the advertising uh, that mass media picks up, television and magazines and newspapers. And because of this inundation with these sexual messages and innuendos, it said many of God's people who are not immune from this assault fall victim. And then it said the majority of those disfellowship each year from the Christian congregation fall as a result of such fleshly desires being given into. And that's not even to mention the many who are not disfellowshipped, but they are in some way disciplined by committees for doing the same thing. Good, they were saved, but it illustrates that a great difficulty and the toughest of tests is when they involve fleshly desires. Now, because of the significance of this, now turn to the chapter we were commenting on, Matthew chapter 4. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on that first case. Okay, does she speak for most of you? you? How many want the question first? All right, here's the question. And then thereafter we'll read Matthew uh, 4, 1 to 4. After we read it, here's the question I'm going to ask for several brief comments. From Jesus' viewpoint, what made this attempt at deception seem plausible? Once again, from Jesus' viewpoint, what made this attempt at deception seem plausible or acceptable or something that was likely? All right, Matthew 4, we'll read the first four verses and then we will ask that question again then Jesus was led by the spirit up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights then he felt hunger also the tempter came and said to him if you are a son of God tell these stones to become loaves of bread but in reply he said it is written, man must live not on bread alone, but on every utterance coming forth through Jehovah's mouth. All right, there's the account. 
You set the rules, so here's the question. From Jesus' viewpoint, why did this attempt at deception of him on the part of the devil seem plausible? There it is. All right, we got some brothers. Okay, several. Uh, now, these have to be brief comments. Uh, okay, put your hands up again. He's ready. All right, here's one. Go right in here. There's one hand. Because Jesus was hungry, it would seem possible for him to do this because he was hungry. So All right. He could have some food. Yeah, that's good. All right, where's the next? Okay. I have, most were going to say that, I guess. Okay. okay. Here's a hand here, and there's one here. Get two in a row. Satan quite correctly identified him as the Son of God. He was the Son of God, so it made it very uh, plausible for him to request this from his father. Good. Over here. On the surface, it didn't appear to be anything wrong with doing that. Mm -hmm. What were we talking about? See, we said a fleshly desire, but what can be said of the fleshly desire? He was appealing to uh, Jesus here, right? Here's a hand right here. Look the other way. It was more than just a desire. It was a necessity. All right. Or perhaps a natural fleshly desire. Mm -hmm. Okay, food, you eat it every day, two or three times. Just comment, brother, right here. And it was similar to the case of Eve. It was something that didn't appear wrong. It was something simple just as eating. All right. Uh, okay, here's another comment. And it had been 40 days and 40 nights. And so, of course, he was very hungry, and this would have been natural for him to want that. Okay. Could he do it? Did could Jesus do it? Was it or out of his range to uh, do this? All right, there's another hand. Right here. Uh, yes, he could do it. Jesus had the ability to uh, turn those stones into bread. Yes, exactly. And think about this. Was there a scripture, and there at that time they had the Hebrew scriptures that read like this, if Satan tries to tempt you to perform a miracle and turn stones to bread, don't do it. <laughs> See, if, if he could have remembered, yeah, I remember reading in the Hebrew scriptures where it said, uh, don't do it if the devil comes. But there was no such scripture. So when you look at this on the surface, it seems quite plausible. To eat was not a sin. He was hungry. He could have rationalized as you brought, well, what's the big deal here? to do a little miracle and turn these stones into a few loaves and get a meal after 40 days of uh, not eating. And you can't show me a Bible verse that says, don't do it. See? So the devil hit right where he felt it would work. This was the first of the three tests. He was making the devil his best effort there. He was appealing, remember, to the most difficult of tests to pass, and that is one that appeals to some fleshly desire that urges for satisfaction. And yet Jesus had the right answer. He says, what is written, and I know this is scripture, it goes back to the time of Moses and the Israelites, that the most important thing in life is not bread or food. Man does not live, he said, on bread or food alone. But what they really have to live off is the expressions from Jehovah's mouth, the things that sustain them in a spiritual sense. And so for me to use this power that God has given me to perform selfishly a miracle to feed myself, simply because I am hungry, would be wrong. When God uh, gives someone the power to perform miracles, as he has in the past given some few, it was always to use that power to help others. 
There's no record of anyone ever selfishly using God-given power of performing a miracle to benefit self. God only gave it to benefit others in a proper way. So Jesus knew this isn't right. So I should not ignore what God's feeling is on miraculous powers just because I've not had a meal in 40 days or 40 nights. So he declined to do it. That was strong. That was proper reasoning on what is contained in God's word. So what's the lesson then for us? Many lessons, but it shows us in particular that even a fleshly desire that is in itself not sinful to satisfy can make problems for us if the circumstances are not right. Now let's make a parallel. Sexual desires in themselves are not wrong. They're not sinful. It's not like some worldly religions teach that the original sin was sexual relations between Adam and Eve. We know it had nothing to do with it. God implanted the sexual desire in Adam and in Eve, and he married them. So within the marriage arrangement, it was proper and appropriate to fulfill that normal desire, that outlet to have sexual relations. So in itself, it's no more wrong than the craving uh, for food. But what can make it wrong? The satisfying of sexual desires. Well, it's made wrong if someone seeks to satisfy it outside of that marital arrangement. If they seek to satisfy it by pornography. If they seek to satisfy it by voyeurism, peeping Tomism, self-abuse, adultery, fornication. The list goes on and on. Why? Because the devil has used these other designs to lure people in to satisfying sexual desires in a wrong and improper way. And the circumstance there is so important to us because it helps us to realize more is involved than simply satisfying some craving or desire that in itself may not be wrong. What are the circumstances? Has Satan designed something there that makes the satisfaction of such a desire wrong because it is not a way that God has lawfully set up things? So, we have to have that in mind. And it's a way that Satan the devil uses today to try to outwit persons. Or getting them to feel, well, this isn't that bad. It can't be that wrong. It's not violating fully what God uh, prescribes in his word, the Bible. No, it's just Satan has come up with all these other things to distort the picture and to try to lure persons in to doing something in a way that is not in harmony with what God says. So Jesus' example is a good one. It helps us to see how we need to be alert, to be watchful when our adversary tries in some way to outwit us in connection with some fleshly desire. So now the question is, what do we need to do to remain watchful and alert in order to be alert to the evil and wicked designs of Satan the devil? But putting it very simply, we need to remain alert to drawing ever closer to God. Remember, much earlier in the discourse, we said the only way Satan is going to be able to get at us as our adversary is if he can draw us away from God, because God is the one who is able to give us the protection that's needed. And you know, one of the greatest underestimations that someone might make in regard to the devil's design is if they feel they can go it alone without God. And the fact of the matter is, unless we are close to Jehovah God and what he has said, 
we're going to remain more and more vulnerable. And this is why when someone is not really keeping up their spirituality through their personal studies, through their meetings and prayer, it can clearly be said they're, they're underestimating the devil's design because they may be thinking that they can face these pressures and these tests alone without God's backing. And that's why the writings here of James are important. James chapter 4. And in the two verses there we're going to read, they contain seven exhortations. That's what I'd like you to look at. In James chapter 4, we're going to read verses 7 and 8 and then make a brief comment on the verses, but there you will find seven exhortations. Now, have in mind an exhortation is an encouragement, but it's like a strong encouragement to do something. All right, see if you can pick them out. James 4, 7. Subject yourselves, therefore, to God, but oppose the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you indecisive ones. Give way to misery and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves in the eyes of Jehovah, and he will exalt you. And if you've counted them correctly, there were seven of those exhortations, if you tally them the same way. The first one is, of course, in verse number seven. All of that is one exhortation. The first part of it said, subject yourselves, therefore, to in other words, if we're not going to underestimate the devil's designs, we have to be willing to submit ourselves fully to what God said. See, to think we can deviate in some way and do part of what God says and part of what the devil says is not going to work. And keep in mind, it doesn't just mean obey what God says. Obedience doesn't go far enough. It said, submit, subject. That's stronger than obedience because a person might pick and choose what they want to obey what God says. But submission means, in effect, that a person surrenders his entire will to that of what God wants him to do. So that's in everything. So that's why the exhortation, it says, subject yourself to God. Submit to him, submit to him entirely, giving in to what his will is. And then the other side of that is if the devil will see that, he sees you're opposing him. If you're going to give him a percentage or do two or three things that he would want you to do, then he feels, well, they're vulnerable. I'm going to stay there. If he sees we're totally in subjection to God, then it says he knows you're opposing him and he'll flee. He'll go away. He'll give up on that for then. He comes back with something else or the same thing. But you got him then because he sees you're totally in submission to what God's will is. Now that second exhortation is in the first part of eight. Draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. Well, that's what we said has to be our focus. How could a person say he would like to keep distance between him and God? Well, we draw close to God by regularly and daily praying to him, taking time to read his word and study it, coming and assembling together with our brothers and sisters as we have this afternoon. When we do that, we're drawing close to God. That's the provision he's made for us. If we do not do those things, then we're sending just the opposite message. We're saying to God, 
I, I think I like a little distance between us. I don't want to be quite that close. I want to be more casual so as to give myself a little more latitude maybe to do what it is I would want to do. So that's why he exhorts us there, draw close to God. Take the time to pray, read, and study on his word. That shows him you want to be close and that you don't want to have that distance. Now what about that third exhortation at the latter part of eight that says, cleanse your hands, you sinners? Is he writing to whirlings here? Heathens, those who do not know about God? He's not. This is written to Christians as a general letter or epistle. But he's saying, cleanse your hands, you sinners, because he recognized in the conduct of some, you had things they needed to correct. Now, not something that would get them put out of the congregation, but they're too close to what the devil has out there. They're nibbling at something that is not appropriate. They're going along to some extent in the direction that Satan is pressuring them through the system. So he says, you know what it is. You know who you are. Cleanse your hands. You send it. Make a change. Then he says there, as the fourth one, uh, close, purify your hearts. The indecisive ones, he, he noticed that they're sort of double-hearted, jumping back and forth between what God says and what Satan through the world is offering. So he's saying that problem is in the heart. You need to purify it. Maybe there's something in the recesses of that figurative heart that needs to be cleaned out. He's saying you know what it is, purify it. Get the motive right. Uh, let Jehovah God see you want to be fully on his side. The fifth exhortation, how did you understand that? Give way to misery and mourn and weep. Sounds like something you wouldn't want to do, but the problem with some there is they were too much in a direction that did not please God, and he wanted to see a little more soberness and more of a repentant attitude. They had become somewhat blasé about their middle-of-the-road stand, that indifference. They weren't really seeing it as something grave enough to make changes for them. So he's saying, give way to misery and mourn and weep. In other words, uh, they are the state of things that show uh, a repentant frame of mind. And that fits in with what the next one that... Uh, is when it says, uh, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. In other words, they were feeling life was just fun and games, recreation, pleasure, good times, waiting for the evenings or weekends so they could do things that brought pleasure to the flesh. They were not taking things so seriously, sort of like, you see, today in some congregations with young people, they always kind of have something to do. What, what are you doing this weekend? Uh, you heard of any gathering going on anywhere? They'll drive a hundred miles to <laughs> see what's happening. What's going on there? I've seen them hear about a concert somewhere and get on a plane and fly there. The last one I heard when they got there, the guy didn't show up. <laughs> that they were seeking to see. So, in other words, he's saying, look, it's too much laughter and joy in a wrong way. You're thinking it's all just fun and games. We're serving God. The devil is our adversary. We need to be fighting him and going to everlasting life. You need to be more concentrated in your thoughts on the ministry and study and Jehovah and what he's doing and was just running with the world. So these were not grave sins. But these were things they needed to make adjustments in. And that's why he gives that exhortation. And then finally, he said, humble yourselves in the eyes of Jehovah. And he will exalt. In other words, admit 
you, you have these things that affect your relationship with God and that the devil is trying to keep you static in that position. Make changes and see how you can progress in your relationship with God. Well, there are the seven exhortations. And that's what's going to help us to stay close to Jehovah God. It's what is going to help us never, never, never to underestimate the designs of Satan the devil. It's going to help us to remain on guard. It's going to help us to be watchful. It's going to help us to stay alert in every way. And the way we do it is by taking seriously the provisions that Jehovah has made for us. And how glad we are that we can take his word and we know what the devil is going to try to do. But he helps us to see also that doesn't mean you can be casual about it. You have to stay alert. You have to stay watchful. You have to keep spiritual. You have to keep focused on the importance of your relationship with God. But if you do all of these things and then never underestimate the devil's efforts to go after you as an individual, then you can stay close to God and it is in that relationship that he can lead you into all the wonderful things he's promised in the future. And in spite of the devil's efforts to destroy your spirituality, you ruin your relationship with God, and place in jeopardy your prospects for everlasting life, you will be able to override all of that with his help and by staying close to him and never underestimating the devil's desire.